Hello and welcome everyone in another episode of Researcher Celebrity. Today, we have Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya with us. A brief introduction about Baswati. She has done her bachelor's in microbiology from Calcutta University and pursued master's in biochemistry again from Calcutta University. Following her passion for research, she joined University of Kansas Medical Center for her PhD and presently Baswati is a postdoctoral researcher at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center. With this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Baswati on the platform. Baswati, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So we start our conversation as how and when you decided that you want to become a researcher. So I initially wanted to be um, to study physics rather than biology. I was I loved physics from my school days, but then I got admission in physics in my bachelor's. But then at that time, microbiology, it was the year 2005 when I started my bachelor's. At that time, microbiology used to be a very uh, new topic in biology and very new subject, very emerging subject in bioscience. So I changed my interest a little bit and then I moved into microbiology. I uh, joined uh, Calcutta University as my uh, in um, undergrad for microbiology. And that's how it started. And then I got um, a first class in my bachelor's and then I joined University of Calcutta in the Department of Biochemistry. So Department of Biochemistry has a huge history. It's one of the first departments that was established across the country. And uh, the trend in that department was um, everybody, the, the, the line that you do after getting your master's is always pursue PhD. So whether in India or abroad, a lot of people, a lot of students um, uh, joined PhD program and our professors also um, encouraged us to pursue PhD because that is the obvious next choice. So, so that is how you can say that I got my uh, interest of that I should pursue research and not really um, go into the other non-academic um, um, streams like pursuing MBA or Nothing of that sort came to my mind at that point. So that's why I decided to uh, do a PhD and um, I got my net uh, qualification and I applied to a certain number of places, but uh, those were not that um, not that fruitful, I would say, because either those interviews were already designated for some people to join or something like that happened. So that's why um, I gave my GRE and got um, admission to one of the universities. I initially came to Illinois mm -hmm. and then I moved to Kansas because my PI again moved from Illinois to a different university. That's when I decided to move to Kansas mm -hmm. and join the PhD program there. Okay. So probably you are the first researcher celebrity we are having here who mm -hmm. wanted to pursue P uh, physics, but not biology not wanted to become a doctor or, you know, physicist in that say, you realized early because of the college, because of the peers that you want to be a researcher. So from bachelors of microbiology, then masters in biochemistry, they are still related, distantly from physics, yes. But then the ideas or the thoughts behind pursuing or joining even before that, let's take a step back and then applications for USA. So what was the first thing which was the most fascinating thing when you were applying for a PhD in USA? So I loved how their websites were, like all the universities had a really clear, um, you know, the programs were really well designed and you can see that they have put in so much effort. Uh, all the labs had a clear pay, lab web page where you can go and um, read about the research which is going on in a particular professor's lab, uh, in a particular PI's lab. You can read through their research. You can read through the, um, you, as if you can see it in front of your eyes. So, and a lot of my seniors also helped me at that time because they, some of them were already here. Some of my batchmates, they were uh, more proactive than I guess I was. So they applied the same year uh, when they passed out their master's and they got through, they were already here. So they also helped me a lot. So 
yeah i had um, a clear picture of whenever you go to any of the us universities you get a clear idea of what this department is all about they have a clear goal they have a uh, they have all the professors they, with along with their lab web page the details of it so it's pretty much easy to apply and it's also it kind of motivates you more like okay i should look through this website i should look to look through this university what this university has to offer and they have a lot of programs like starting from the basic biomedical science umbrella program to a lot of different categories of programs which uh, we do not see a lot and maybe it's not that well defined in the other universities uh, in other countries but in us they have clearly well defined programs like immunology or cancer microbiology um, molecular biology program just biological science as a program mm -hmm. or developmental biology cell biology so all these programs are such well defined and each of them are so different from the other that it actually motivates you that maybe you should study developmental biology you should apply to that program mm -hmm. or maybe you should if you are interested in cell biology you can apply to the cell biology program mm -hmm. so that kind of was very well defined and that actually helped me in my application process okay so now when you landed in united states probably first time or at least first time for the longest time out of the home mm -hmm. so how was that to leave the country obviously passionate about research but when you move countries you were fortunate that your peers were there before you who helped you also but still if you can uh, start from the cultural shock which you faced might be or might not be and then how that journey went so i i'm kind of the first daughter maybe in my family to go abroad to study something mm -hmm. so my brothers have been like two of my cousins they have uh, come to the us my, before me but i was the first one in the family at least the first girl in the family so it it was really my father was not really up for it he never wanted me to pursue phd in us away from him so he was very emotional at that time but eventually when he saw me uh, being successful he he was okay about it so that was fine and then when i came here from um, from calcutta directly i came to the us i had one of my uncle who was here in new jersey so i stayed with them for some time and my aunt was he's a superhuman being so he she actually helped me a lot uh, getting me started setting me up so i was kind of fortunate in that way i would say and i had my friends also so i did not really have a lot of culture shock other than the thing that i wouldn't call it a culture shock rather it's a good thing that there is so much diversity in this country you get to see a lot of different uh, people from all over the world coming here so that gives you and i came in a uni, in a proper university in carbondale in illinois where there were people from all over the world so you get to meet a lot of different people you get to be friends with them so that was the best part of it i don't want to call it as a culture shock but i would rather call it a maybe a i don't know maybe getting a diversity more being in a more diverse environment that helps you you know open up your mind and also uh meet different cultures learn about them uh make you make friends so it's it's really a different kind of experience maybe in a good way not in a bad way but and and our international office was really helpful i think all of the universities have a very fantastic um uh international program where they actually help you right from getting your roommate my roommate was a chinese uh, friend of who who was my roommate so she was from china and yeah you get to mix with a lot of different kinds of people and you get to interact with them you learn a lot of things about us which never existed in india like the ssn starting from getting ssn getting from your setting up your bank account setting up like getting a car maybe getting driver's license here in us so that's everything is like new at that time mm -hmm. for the first time i was doing all those things so yeah i wouldn't call it maybe not a culture shock but 
Yes. Okay. The other thing I would like to point out is like we didn't have very good Indian restaurants in Illinois at that time, so that might be a culture shock. You don't get your food like you don't get your um, Indian good food there, not in every place. Uh, so that might be a culture shock to many people. That is absolutely is that is absolutely a biggest concern of most of the Indians yes. who goes to United States to pursue their education or for the job. So. now when you joined a, a lab like if we can say the dream which you want to pursue for couple of years so starting from joining the lab to graduation if you can walk us through and share the journey with us that how that experience was yes so i uh, yeah like as i said before i joined uh, in um, i first joined in a lab in carbondale in southern illinois university then my pi decided to move to texas this happens a lot and i'm pretty sure many of the incoming students they will be shocked to see that their pi suddenly decides that they will move universities they will they will have to move from one university and get admission in another university that becomes really complicated but trust me it's very common it happens here all the time So that happened and then I applied to Kansas and I got admission there I moved to Kansas So that was a new beginning kind of thing and uh, my the the lab from which I got my PhD degree my PI was super supportive with my admission and everything he helped a lot uh, I joined his lab directly instead of rotating into other labs So then afterwards the real i think the real struggle began like working through your experiments not getting results and then finally one fine day you get a brilliant result that turns everything towards the positive goal so so that took me about 3 years to set up everything to set up the experiments to get the results and finally you get your like eureka moment when you see that the project is going towards the finishing line and i think my pi was super supportive my lab mates were like i mean they were they were my support system at that time so you tend to bond with your lab mates more and they tend to help you a lot more right from the discussions about science about philosophy about life in general so they kind of become your family and i i was fortunate enough to have the two most brilliant minds as seniors in my lab they were postdocs they were both postdocs at that time one i would like to take names pratikom and uh, abhishek ganguly they were both postdocs in my lab and they helped a lot for me to get through the all the obstacles of a phd life has to offer so uh then here in us there is a qualifying exam that you have to pass in order to get to the final point of your phd degree that's the only hurdle i remember i used to study a lot during for my qualifying exam like that is i mean that's a different level of it. i mean preparedness that you have to make in order to because there will be a committee who will be judging you right from the start it's a grilling session kind of thing it goes on for like almost 3 hours and then at the end they will decide whether you pass or whether you fail so and actually people fail in this exam so that's not a good thing for your cv so once you pass that life becomes a little bit easy then you can breathe a sigh of relief then at the after that you just have to focus on your paper get one manuscript out and then defend and then graduate so after i mean my phd had been ha, have been more or less smooth i wouldn't call it full of obstacles and things like that and of course you always have conflict with your pi i mean that's bound to happen because you are two different individuals that is always about to happen it's so like a relationship that you share for 5 or 6 years but at the end when you graduate when you get your degree when you get your postdoc offer when you get your manuscript out what else do you need like you have i mean you have ticked off everything from your bucket list so that's what you need at the end of the day so yeah i would say that's kind of a very brief overview of my how my phd went and yeah probably you are again uh, in so many terms one of the first researcher celebrity who said that it was a smooth journey because 99.99% of the phd are the roller coaster ride and a ferocious one not even a simple one people like so now let's th- uh, 
ask you this thing that when you said it was very smooth, were there any times when you have ever thought of quitting PhD or research per se? No, because I am I'm not a quitter. So mm -hmm. I have that strong resilient phenotype you can call. Like I would never quit because it took me a lot of a um, lot of hard work to reach till the stage which I was at, getting admission in a U.S. university and staying away from home, from family. So I was never that person who will who will quit halfway. If I've committed to something, I'm that person who will take it all the way through, no matter how much like stress. Of course, there was a lot of stressful nights, a lot of stressful days. Um, I was fortunate enough that my experimental model worked well. So I worked in placenta development in a mouse model. So that worked well. So I got a good phenotype. I got like some good results, which helped me. In that way, scientifically, my journey was smooth. But mm -hmm. other than that, there there is always ups and downs when you are going through your PhD life. There will be a lot of stressful nights, a lot of you went out frustration on your loved ones. I remember I used to call up my mother and always used to vent out frustration about lab life, about PhD life. So, but again, at the end of the day, when you hold that certificate in your hand, when you have a doctor in front of your name, maybe I don't use it that often, but I should, that kind of, you know, like uh, makes you feel, feel happy about it and makes you feel like, okay, it's worth it maybe at the end of the day. No, absolutely. And let's talk about the stress part yes. of it because it is most of the researchers and one of the reasons why we have these conversations with our researcher celebrities so empowering science foundation believe in breaking the barriers one of the barrier is that phd is stressful people think about it and some people just don't join it because of that what we want to create here is as a network that if a phd student presently is facing some issue and encounter these videos so they can correlate that they are not the only one so who also have a, either they say that their phd was very smooth or the one who say it was nightmare or people say that oh it was full of a roller coaster ride everyone has their share of stress in there and what phd trains us dr other uh, my phd supervisor he always taught one thing that phd is not a degree it's a training for lifetime. So it sets you up for the entire life. If you have done this well, you can sustain anything. So your support system, if you can share and guide or suggest the, you know, how they can rejuvenate and come out of this stress, the researchers. Okay, so to, I mean, if you want to, um... Like stress is a big factor in any PhD graduate student's life. I used to read a lot of the PhD comics because that used to stress re stress relief me for some time in my lab. I used to laugh because those were so relatable. You can actually relate to it a lot. So one thing, I mean, if you have good lab mates, and for me, I was fortunate enough to have really good lab mates, really good support system within the lab. We were like a family. Then a lot of the stress gets eased out. Even if you are having conflict with your PhD boss, like your PI, if you're having regular conflicts with him or her, then it helps you to um, get an additional support system and they can guide you like, okay, you don't, you don't. And also one more thing that I learned from my PhD was always keep a very calm head, very cool head. Don't react to the situations that I used to do a lot during my PhD. So I would say... I have mellowed down a lot over the years. So you don't really react. You think about it. You apply your emotional intelligence to it. Maybe get some online courses done on emotional intelligence, which makes you have a grip on your maybe temper. Sometimes we are we are all human beings. We have different sets of emotions going on within us. But I think those really helps you to, you know, calm down and maybe not react to very small instances. And maybe that can be dealt with at a later time but just focus on your goals like if you have a goal to get a good phd get a good paper out of here that's what all you need for your phd i know a lot of people who have been in toxic labs in toxic environments but if you if you lose that hope and if you see that you actually can't get anything positive out of it then it's not worth it maybe you should quit and maybe you should move on get another um, get another position in another place uh, but if you see that 
maybe everything else fits well, but there is just one slight conflict with one of the person in the lab. It might be your PI or it might be another lab mate. So you have to think about the greater goods at that uh, position. Like you have to think about the greater goals. Like you have to focus on the bigger goals here. What do you want out of that? Uh, if you think that after doing your PhD, it's not really worth that much of stress, that much of tension all throughout, then maybe it's it's a good idea not to get a PhD at all. It's not the, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And if you really think that, okay, I can get this, this, this checked off my list. If I have my PhD done from this lab, then probably go for it um, and be a bit more resilient. Maybe take the help of your lab people, lab mates or friends in your graduate school there is the international program who can help you, or there are other um, students who can actually have, you can have a discussion group where you can all talk about what you are going through and th those really help. And my, fortunately, my husband was uh, also in a different PhD program in the same university. So that was again, another support point where I can go back and talk to him. And he was also doing his PhD at that time. So it was a lot of conversations that also help you to get through these situations. Yeah, so this is one thing which we always try to tell our audience here that there is nothing which cannot be resolved by talking. So if exactly. you are having conflicts or stress, the first thing is you should have, a, and everyone, I believe, by the time we join PhD, everyone has this system which you can call as support system. Depends. It can vary from family to friends to relatives or in uh, cases like Bhaswati just mentioned, it can be your lab mate. In fact, in my case, it was my PI. So if I have anything, I'll just go to him and then I'll mention that this is what is going through. And everyone has to create their own support system, which they can rely. This is not only part of PhD, but in any other profession also, if you are there, you should have these people who you can go talk out and not only uh, taking your frustration out, but getting the ideas from them also. Because often what have been observed in biological sciences, when people are so focused and they become the victim of tunnel vision. So you cannot think out of the box, but when you are talking to a friend who has nothing to do with biology, when, when you are sharing that, okay, I'm facing this problem, this trouble, and then they give you a perspective which you might or might not understand at that time. But lately, when you are thinking about it, and then you say, that makes sense. Let's try it. And then, then comes that Eureka moment. Baswati was mentioning that now everything is working. So you have to be open about your stress, or we can say your challenges, because these are all the challenges, the obstacles, which trains you well. And that's why it takes you know a couple of years for the PhD. And one more thing which you have, everyone I think should honor about the PhD is you are putting a piece of a puzzle which no one in the world has done. It is, it can be incremental, it can be the innovation, it can be anything, but you or anyone else who decide that they want to pursue a PhD have to understand this thing that your PhD proposal as Baswati was mentioning about the qualifier exams in case of United States, but even in India, your PhD proposal is so unique that nowhere in the world anyone has done the same work. So either you are dealing with a different geographical species or you are doing with something, but there is not the same thing which somebody has already done because then you don't qualify for that PhD in itself. So Baswati, when you were decide uh, like you achieved your phd so before completing the phd you had this idea that you want to pursue uh, like you want to take the postdoctoral researcher route or you had different plans so in my last year uh, when i was um, the so so the year before that basically the year before i defended i started looking into different options different career paths so staying in Kansas, it was very difficult to go to a non-academic um, pathway because it was very hard to communicate with other people in industries because Kansas is a really closed community and you don't get 
that many industrial opportunities, at least at that time, I mean, five, six years before. Uh, I did not have many opportunities or many friends in the industries whom I can connect with. So industrial opportunity was out of question at that time for me. And the alternate plan that I had at that time was why not go for a postdoctoral position? That will be the best and the easiest option to get through. So it was then that I started actively looking for postdoctoral positions. I went to a conference where I actively networked with a lot of PIs for probable postdoctoral opportunities if we are a good, if I'm a good fit in their lab. Um, I actively networked with them and asked them to come to my poster so that I can present my work to them, kind of a mini presentation. So uh, I remember I wrote emails to them 15 days before asking them to asking them for a time where I can meet with them because they, these are super busy people. I mean, all the PIs, they come there for a short time and they are not interested unless they really see that interest in you to apply yeah. to their lab. So that's how I got uh, my postdoctoral position. I uh, ended up, uh, I, um, I landed a postdoctoral position with Dr. Jennifer Zalen, who is my current PI. But again, that the, it is an interesting story how I got uh, the postdoctoral position because initially Dr. Zalen did never replied to me when I emailed her during the conference. And I was a bit, I somehow, she, Somehow I missed her in the name list for all the PIs uh, in that conference. And when I, I just entered a um, room where she was giving a talk at that time. And I loved her. I loved the way she presented her work. I loved her work that I wrote an email to her just that night itself. But I, I knew that I was late in writing to her. Maybe she has left the conference. And actually, she never replied at that time. But then after a long time, I remember my PI one day, he came up and he said that, you applied to Dr. Zalen and she actually called me today and we had a conversation. I recommended you and she might be calling you back. And I was like, who, what? I was, I forgot about her because she never replied to me. Mm -hmm. And then it came to my mind, okay, there was one PI whom I applied and she never replied back. So maybe this is that person. So after that, I had a conversation with her. I came here for a presentation for me to meet the entire lab in person. And they liked me. I liked them. So that's how um, it, I landed up that, um, I mean, this great opportunity to be a postdoc in Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center. So, yeah, that's how I decided that, okay, postdoc is the next best path. So I'm, I'm still deciding that whether I should go into the academic line because it's not, it doesn't depend on you whether you want or not. It depends on a lot of other factors. You have to get um, maybe a starting award like K99 or something like that to start with if you want to have an academic position. You will need to have that temperament to be a PI, which I think I might not have because being a PI needs a lot of time, needs a lot of effort, needs a lot of your, um, a, a lot of motivation that you really need to be having all those characteristics to be a successful PI. You really, and yeah, you don't really want to be one such PI who is not, not dedicated or not, doesn't enjoy science, right? It's all about how passionate you are, how, um, how motivated you are to have your own lab, to have your own setup. So yeah, right now I'm trying to explore other opportunities as well, both in industry and also in academia. I'm also planning to apply for K99. That will be kind of a shot at the academics, academic uh, um, uh, setup. So yes, it all depends on what, it all depends on the stepwise, how if I get the K99, then maybe academic route. If not, then maybe industrial route. So it all depends on a lot of things and not what you wish to be, you wish or you want to be, especially in such competitive world like what we are in today. Yeah, and this is one uh, thing which should which everyone should approach to this open-mindedness. Don't fi fix yourself that, okay, you just want to do this. You, mm -hmm. because this increases the idea and the chances of your success for sure. And then second is until you have tasted something, you don't know that you, whether you like it or not. We have seen researchers, celebrities who loved the wet lab work when they were doing their PhD. But post PhD, they were done with the wet lab work and now they want to be on the computer 
or went to the teaching profession. So this is something until you have tasted, you cannot be 100% sure that whether you like it or you hate it, as you mentioned correctly. And here I would like to say one thing to all the audience and viewers who are in their penultimate years or final years of their PhD, unanswered emails might not be unread also, okay? So in Bhaswati's case, what we have seen is like, even without getting an answer, she got the postdoc. So think about it. So never give up on writing emails, approaching the PI's interest, the labs you are interested in, because that is the first thing why you write emails. But if even if there are no responses, just try to make sure that your supervisor is aware of that. Because in India, what we think and assume that the person we are doing PhD with, our advisor, we can name them anywhere, anytime. You can assume it, but never take it for granted. Always, whenever you are writing an email, even if it is a casual mail, that if you are interested in someone's lab, as Baswati was serious about it, the PI might contact if they like your interest, your email, your, you know, send. I, I have seen or uh, met people who were selected because the PI was so impressed by the email. They saw the enthusiasm that they already made up their mind that they want to select you. So whenever you are writing these mails, never, never, ever take it casually. Because if you cannot be serious about writing emails to your prospective bosses, never think that they can select you because they are serious researchers, supervisors, and they want a student who's serious enough. So this is the one thing. Second thing, stay motivated, all we can say. So now, Bhaswati, when everything is going well, it seems like you are the one who's enjoying research more than anyone else. What are the future plans and what you can suggest uh, to the PhD students when they are submitting or about to submit their thesis, how they should uh, approach the world? Yes. So you brought up a very good point, like how you should write emails. That is very important. I mean, you should take your time, read. I mean, most of the PIs in US have a really updated website. If they don't have a very updated website, you can always go on to PubMed and search up, look up for their papers, their recent papers, put in effort because it shows when you write your emails, you, the, your one line will show how much research or how much time you put when you were writing that email. And yeah, you pointed out a very good thing, like be serious about it when you are doing it. Otherwise, don't apply. I mean, because PIs here, they really look to look for that motivation in your email, like how interested you might be to work with them. Because I remember I, I did not even have Dr. Zalan in my list. So I never studied like or read up what she worked on. But I, re I, I listened to her talk, I remember, with full concentration. And I was taking notes and I was just, I was so much involved in her talk. I was so invested in her talk that I made notes. And based on those notes, I wrote her that email. And she was impressed by that email. That's why she took the effort to contact my PI, talk to him, and then, then, then everything worked out. So whenever you are going, especially for the PhD students who are in their last year and deciding um, for a postdoc positions, go to seminars, go to conferences, you know, uh, listen to PIs whom you really want to work with. There are many international conferences. Go there, uh, make new friends, in, network a lot, I would say. Talk to the PIs, have a conversation with them. It does not have to be always about business, always about getting a postdoc position or anything. Talk to them about your research. Uh, have, have a question in your mind, which you can ask them. And that actually shows them that, okay, you have interest in their work. You have really done your homework. And then when you write that email after maybe going through a couple of their recent papers or maybe looking through their website, then when you write that email, maybe the question might be very novice. It's, it might be very, you know, very, maybe not such a great idea that you have in your mind. But once you write that, however novice your question is, that PI will take note of it. Okay, this person has thought about it. It might be a novice question, but that person put that effort in the email. 
because i have i have heard pi is always complaining that people just send very general email don't write something like this like oh i love your work i have read this 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 paper i love your work i love your research don't write these things because these are a strict no no you have to write i love this part of your work i love this protein that you worked with maybe if this protein can do this function do you think that this might also do this function write something like this write some put, put some effort or think about a uh, a question that you have in your mind after reading maybe one of our recent papers that shows that you are interested in that work never write like very basic lame language like oh i love your work i i i have followed your research what does that even mean like then write two more lines like i have followed this paper this project in going on in your lab can you elaborate about this part of that work that you are working on this protein how is this protein working how is this protein functioning now maybe go into a little bit more details about it because that shows that you have really thought about it you are interested in her work you went back and did your homework before writing that email to her because you never know some pi's can really be so interested in you after reading your email they will contact you back because many i have seen many phd students from india just saying that oh i don't get reply from pi's i have written to so 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 many pi's because you are not writing the email in the correct way i mean write to them as if you are really interested to join their lab and not like sending out thousand applications it doesn't work sometimes only one email will work for you and sometimes even sending out 50 emails won't ever work you won't ever get a response i remember i got response from all the pi's whom i wrote except for zalin because she never replied to me then but then she directly talked to me that's how her her approach towards recruiting a postdoc is she directly talks to the pi first and then talks to the candidate not the other way around so yeah i kind of networked i met with a lot of pis who were having new lab set up at that time so you never know when and how a pi can be interested in your work recruiting you as a postdoc in the lab so yeah. always make that effort i would say so you just mentioned uh, briefly and we are almost uh, going to touch our timeline for the conversation also but let's talk about the role of networking how important is that for post phd absolutely or even in case of pre phd too networking is very important i know a lot of people are very introvert i am basically a very introvert person i wouldn't really go up to a person and say a hi hello and start a conversation with him but when you are trying to get a postdoc position or an industrial position try to read up that person before you actually go on networking with him maybe read about where he did his phd where he did his bachelor's or masters from and what his body of work is all about if that person is in industry then try to gauge like, like how his background was where where from he did his studies and then how he transitioned into that role that he is now and try to form some questions in your mind about the current role he is in and then if you are interested in that role it will be easier for you to converse with him on that uh, aspect and for pis i think it is easier if you know the science that he is working on if you know the projects that you are interested in then you can just hit a conversation like that and easiest thing to network is just invite them to your poster just invite them if you are having a podium talk just invite them to come to your talk and most of the pis they are interested they will have some time to come to your poster and look at your poster maybe and then that will lead to further conversation you know they will ask you questions about your work you will answer and you might ask them some questions so that's how it works it's always a back and forth conversation absolutely and here i would just uh, like to tell all the audience and viewers that uh, do your homework before writing the emails that is the one thing which you should take home from this conversation and the second thing is that hard work support system diversity the attitude which we have observed uh, in basmati today is like so different when people say cultural shock she used the word diversity so how you look at the world is how you see it and that's what you can be happy miserable sad it everything depends on to you and i would like to say thanks baswati for sharing the journey experience and giving word of wisdom to our viewers and i will say that it was very enlightening for me in so many ways like case of attitude the way you use the words 
And no wonder that you got response from everyone of the PIs you wrote the emails because the selection of word is the key. And the one who did not respond hired you. So <laughs> that was a success too. Here uh, on the last notes of this conversation, I would like to say that Basuti comes from Kolkata. Okay. A very famous world renowned personality, Swami Vivekananda, we all know, was also selected by his guru. Okay. Ramakrishna Paramahans Ji went to him to do and something similar what we have seen in case of Basavati also, that PI connecting with the PI first and then coming, to, uh, selecting the candidate. With this, we'll say, keep motivated, stay enthusiastic for your passion of research. And if you want to write to dir directly to Basavati, you can obviously write to her. If you want Empowering Science Foundation to put you in touch with our researcher celebrities, please feel free to write to, to us and let's create a network of enthusiastic researchers where we all can celebrate research. With this, I'll say thank you very much, Maswati. Thank you for this initiative. And I think you're doing a wonderful job because researchers should have a face and your podium just does that. Thank you so much for this initiative. Thank you for the nice, sweet, kind words. And for all the audience, stay tuned for another episode of Researcher Celebrity. RBSK saying bye for today. <laughs>